This week, we're headed back to the First World War with a whole stack of exclusive footage fresh from our hands-on time with Battlefield 1, as well as a chat with Swedish developer DICE to find out what's new in this upcoming FPS. And then, for a bit of balance, we also check out a nifty hardware solution, the WD MyCloud EX2 Ultra, perfect for your backups and your media. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this week the entire world is getting up and out of the house running around the great outdoors. Niantic and Nintendo have released Pokemon Go, a nifty combination of childhood nostalgia and augmented reality. The game first got a soft launch in Australia and New Zealand on July 6 and has since spread almost completely around the globe, prompting fans everywhere to go catch them all. Avid Australian fans quickly started organising Pokemon Go walks, with thousands of gamers signing up to attend events in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth, with others planned across New Zealand and, we're sure, just about every other country in good time. But that wasn't the only big surprise released this week. Rockstar Games finally confirmed that Red Dead Redemption would be playable on Xbox One through backward compatibility, and then surprised us all by making it available much quicker than we anticipated. If you have a copy of the 2010 game for Xbox 360, either digitally or on a disc, you will be able to jump right into the Wild West without too much extra effort. No, it's not quite the same as having a sequel available on new generation hardware, but it is definitely better than nothing. On the other hand, if you are a PlayStation gamer and miss out on the new release of Red Dead Redemption, all is not lost. You get your very own Rockstar Games re-release, The Warriors, first released in 2005 for PS2 and the original Xbox. It's not so much a remaster as a slightly dusted off version with 1080p upscaling and trophy support, but it is out now for PS4 via the PlayStation Store, so you can't really go wrong. And on a similar note, 2K Games accidentally took the wraps off of something special a little earlier than it may have intended to. We'd been hearing rumours of the revamped release for a while now, with the Taiwanese rating board, the Brazilian rating board and even the ESRB referring to the project, but 2K remained stubbornly tight-lipped, refusing to comment even when the evidence was accidentally reposted to its own website. Less than 24 hours later though, and all was revealed. The Bioshock Collection contains the original Bioshock, as well as Bioshock 2 and Bioshock Infinite, as well as all-story DLC, never-before-seen snippets including director's commentary, and a museum of orphaned concepts showing off bits and pieces that never made it into the original games. We swim in different oceans but land on the same shore. And it always starts with a lighthouse. It's due out in September for PC, PS4 and Xbox One, and if you've already got a copy of either Bioshock or Bioshock 2 on PC, you will get an HD upgrade of your game for free. Bioshock Infinite is apparently already shiny enough and is not being given the visual tweaks of the other two. In other news, Blizzard is hiring for something mysterious. New jobs have popped up for unannounced Project Diablo, which has sparked more than a few imaginations. Currently, the studio is looking for artists, animators and a game director, with descriptions referring to dark medieval worlds, visceral action and a love of RPGs. At this stage, there is no guessing quite what this actually is. Remember that both World of Warcraft and Hearthstone could have been described as unannounced Warcraft projects, so while this could be a new standalone game, perhaps Diablo 4, it could also be something very different. Similarly, we could hear something about the game at this year's BlizzCon, but I wouldn't hold my breath. In hardware news, Microsoft has announced its Play Anywhere service for Xbox will start rolling out in September. From that point on, buying certain games digitally on Xbox One or PC will give you access to the same game on the other platform, with both copies sharing achievements, save files and even DLC. The service will start with the launch of ReCore and will include both, both major releases like Gears of War 4 and Forza Horizon 3, as well as ID and Xbox titles like Cuphead and We Happy Few. In what feels like a case of anything you can do, I can do better, rumours have started to circulate that a newer, slimmer PlayStation 4 is also in the works as well as the upgraded model Neo. Word on the street hints that Sony will make an announcement at a game show in September, so keep an eye out for the manufacturer's presence at Tokyo Game Show. In quick news, No Man's Sky is officially finished with Sean Murray pleased to announce the game has gone gold ahead of its August release. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is officially getting a Game of the Year re-release which will definitely contain all of the free DLC for the game and hopefully both paid expansions as well. 
Xbox Live Director of Programming Major Nelson is headed down under as the Storytime keynote speaker for PAX Australia in November. Tickets are still available for this three-day event, which hits the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre from November 4 to 6. 2K Games has surprised everybody by making last year's 4v1 action title Evolve free to play on PC. Developer Turtle Rock explains that the decision came after seeing the DLC shitstorm dragging gamers further and further from their first magical pick up and play experience. The new business model is being tested through an open beta process which will let the studio completely rework the game as we know it. Turtle Rock co-founder Chris Aston thanks each and every one of you who bought Evolve when it was available, promising a special founder status once the game transitions completely and hinting at gifts, rewards and special access for those people who financially supported the game. And in movie news, while it might be a little bit early to buy your tickets, we do have a date for that upcoming Tomb Raider reboot. Mark your calendars, Lara Croft is set to return to the big screen on January 16, 2018. If you are a comics fan, that date might sound familiar. It's one that Warner Brothers had earmarked for a DC Comics film, probably The Flash, but maybe Aquaman, before this recent backflip. Disappointingly for you comic fans, we're sorry to say there is no new date suggested for the DC adaptation. This new Tomb Raider is an interpretation of the Crystal Dynamics reboot that we've seen in both the 2013 Tomb Raider and last year's Rise of the Tomb Raider. So while Alicia Vikander is stepping into some pretty iconic boots, she won't actually be playing Angelina Jolie. For more information on any of these stories or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around. We've got plenty more still to come. that we would probably get a new Battlefield game in 2016. It's been three years since Battlefield 4, so the time felt right for Battlefield 5. But Swedish studio DICE has thrown us a bit of a curveball. This year's release is not Battlefield 5. It's Battlefield 1, and we are headed back to the trenches of the First World War. While we were at E3, we caught up with Daniel Berlin, lead world designer at EA DICE in Stockholm, and asked him a few questions about what we can expect from the new game, starting with the giant inflatable elephant in the room, those enormous floating airships. These are not, you know, like something that is like setting on a preset direction that you just jump into. It's like they are completely movable. You drive them around on the map. And also in terms of like where it goes down, perhaps you've seen like when the, when, when the airship crashes, it's not pre-scripted where it goes down. It goes down where it goes down. So you can be the pilot of that airship, look at your health bar and go like, okay, we're about to go down, but I still want to get the F flag. You know, and so I'm just going to drive the airship over there and then just as it goes down, you just crash it right down on the town, on that flag, takes out everything that it lands on, and then you guys can just swoop in and capture that flag. So we really didn't want to restrict anything this time around, just like build a multiplayer sandbox and then just let the players decide how they want to play the game. We have taken objective apples. Tying in with what Daniel said, you will be able to play the game you want to play and your choice of class will make a big difference to what you're able to do. Pick from Assault, Medic, Support, Scout, Tanker or Pilot and choose wisely because while each one has its own unique loadout, there are no cross-class weapons. Once you've got your favourite gun, you've got your favourite class because none of the others will be able to use it. We are losing objective. We also found out a few more things about what's in store when Battlefield 1 launches in October. From a technical perspective, we're told that the game will support high tick rate servers on release, with the PC version running at at least 60 hertz. We're also plonked into the middle of larger, more open environments than we've seen in any other Battlefield game to date. And while we were only given one map to play on, the multiplayer map collection will take you all over the world, including the Alps, the Western Front and even Arabia.
chatting further to Daniel, we asked what had been significantly worked on since the release of Battlefield 4. Actually, we took a big look at all the systems we have in the entire game. Uh, like also like the small parts of the game, you know, like for example, movement. How can we push movement further this time around? So we looked at like, you know, like if you want to go through a door, for example, you don't have to walk up to the door, interact with the door, and then go through. We wanted that whole experience to be more fluid. So this time around, if you're just sprinting, you can just sprint and just barge through doors. Um, and all the Battlefield titles also run into scenarios maybe, you know, like the way to come up to a ledge. And that ledge, you're like, why can't I jump over this ledge? So this time around, we, we let you actually, like, you can grab ledges that are, like, taller than yourself as well to just jump over them. Uh, so it's just, like, looking at all those systems and making sure that we push everything one step further. And also in terms of, like, you know, the dynamic world. Um, I don't know if you remember playing Parasol Storm and Battlefield 4 and the weather's coming in. Everybody loved that so much. So we just said, like, you know, hey, let's just add dynamic weather patterns to every map and the entire game instead. Uh, and it's like you don't know what weather is going to be triggering when you're playing the map. It's not set sequence. It's different every time you play it. You can go into a map and it can be sunny day, the entire map. And the next time you're playing it, it could be sunny day and then the fog rolls in and then it starts to just rain. So then that pushes you to change how you play. For example, if you're a sniper in one of the windmills on the San Quentin Scar map that we're playing here today um, and the fog rolls in, you have, before the fog rolled in, you have long engagement ranges. You could snipe at a range, but now you can't see anything, so you better just change it up. You can maybe pull out your hatchet and go, go to town, pretty much. And it kind of brings a whole new feeling to it, you know, because once those engagement ranges get pulled in, it kind of gets quiet because the gunfire lessens, and now it becomes a little bit airy. And then you, all of a sudden, you just hear, like, someone shouting, and they're coming at you with a bayonet charge from behind, and it's just, it's just super dynamic. Obviously, multiplayer is still a massive part of Battlefield 1, with the game again supporting up to 64 players. This time around, a new squad system means that you'll be able to team up with your friends and move through servers together, entering and leaving at the same time. This might not sound like much, but once you've got a good team together, it's reassuring to know that they'll be there in the next round. Halfway there, we have the upper hand. We have taken objective apples. You talked before about doors and ledges and stuff. If all else fails, just blow it away, right? That's that's pretty much it. Yeah, like if there's no door for you, you can make your own door. So like pretty much everything in this game is destructible. And we're adding a whole new layer to that destruction. We wanted players to be able to be creative in their destruction. And what I mean by that is we want you to be able to pick a house asunder piece by piece. Uh, so for example, you can enter a house, walk up to the second floor, flow down, like throw down some explosive ordnance on the staircase underneath you, blow that up, take that staircase out. No, now no one else can actually get up into that floor with you. And it's super cool. And actually, I want to mention also the way we're using the system ground information, we're calling it. Basically, how craters have a much larger gameplay impact this time around. I've seen people playing the game now, it's just like they're running around the map, the airship comes in, the huge behemoth, it starts to bomb the landscape, and it basically turns big open fields into like a Swiss cheese. So people that actually survived that bombardment, they got low health, 
the, what they do now, instead of like, you know, trying to run for cover, they just roll into the craters that are being created. And then they can use the craters as cover as they go through. So you can sit in a crater, crater and like, in crouch, and then you'll peek up and then fire and then go to the next crater. So you can actually create your own covers like that as well. We didn't talk much about single player while we were at E3, but Battlefield 1 will explore ideas based on real world historical events. The campaign features multiple protagonists telling the stories of unknown war heroes. We also didn't talk about customization, but we're promised there's a lot of that on the way as well. We are winning. We have taken objective Freddy. If you look at the, the, uh, the technology that came in in that era, it started off, you know, in the old world with like horses and, you know, sabers and stuff like that. But as the, as the conflict came to, to a close at the end, like all the, this, this big industrial era, you swept it. And it was a time of innovation. So there's so much weaponry that actually was the first time you saw it ever. So you will actually see, you know, light machine guns, fully automatic rifles, semi-automatic rifles, small machine guns, shotguns, bolt action rifles. So we can actually give players that battlefield experience that they know and love. And you can pretty much cater your play style to the weapon loadout that you like. So we can actually push the pacing and keep the same pacing as you know from Battlefield. On one hand, what Daniel's talking about is a good thing. The game plays nicely and feels snappy like a modern FPS. On the other, this is a shooter set in a completely different time period and we were hoping for more authenticity. The visuals and the movement all feels era appropriate right up until the point where you pull out a weapon and use the same old spray and pray gunfire we've seen in every other FPS to date. Sure, it's what we're used to, and sure, it suits a certain sort of gameplay, but it felt jarring in a game that was trying so hard to create a sense of immersion of putting yells right inside the trenches. That said, it depends on what you want from your shooter. If you are able to put that bit aside, Battlefield 1 is shaping up to be a solid FPS. The First World War setting brings something new to the genre, from new maps to the new weapons to the inevitable new strategies, and of course, the game looks spectacular. It sounds like DICE has looked carefully at its earlier games, throwing out the parts that didn't work and focusing on improving the ones that did, which should make this new one a very strong shooter when it hits shelves later in the year. We're looking forward to seeing you in the trenches. So when can we expect to get our hands on this great war? So the game will be out on the 21st of October on Xbox One, PlayStation 4 and PC. to have a DVD collection, a CD collection, music and video that was kept somewhere other than on your hard drives? With more and more of our media collections becoming digital, figuring out the ideal way to store your data is crucial and sometimes the hard drive on your desktop PC isn't quite right for the job. One option is an external NAS, that is, a network accessible storage device, like this one, the WD MyCloud EX2 Ultra. This is an external RAID hard drive. This model has two 2 terabyte WD RED hard drives, but there are other sizes available, even one without any drives, so that you can bring your own. Both hard drives work together to keep your data safe. They are identical copies of each other, so if one suffers some sort of failure, the other one will still have all of your stuff. Of course, what you do with that storage is up to you. I immediately threw my music collection on there and it took just a few moments to set up the new location in iTunes before I was happily listening to my favourite songs and relishing in all my newfound hard drive space. The NAS is set up as just another network drive, which required minimal effort and was very easy to set up. Even more impressive though was the way the WD MyCloud handles videos. With the new hardware set up properly on my home network, it's recognised by my smart TV as a DLNA device, that is, as a media player, not as a network drive. This makes watching videos a dream. I can use my TV remote control to navigate through menus and lists, select the one I want and fast forward and rewind while watching. It might not sound like much, but it is a neat, elegant solution. 
The WD MyCloud Ultra is also a good fit for PC gamers, adding a little redundancy and flexibility to your gaming rig. The access speed on the Ultra will obviously depend on the speed of your network, so it will be notably slower than an SSD, but it's plenty quick enough to play most games. This means if you have a hefty gaming library, you don't need to invest in a supersized SSD with the supersized price tag that goes with it. Instead, install your operating system and essential files locally and pop all your games and media on the WD MyCloud Ultra. Mount it as a network drive or, if you're up to it, as a local hard drive using iSCSI and you're good to go. This also has the added bonus of being accessible from other PCs on your network so you don't need to lug your gaming PC from room to room just to play games. Another thing I quite liked actually combines the video element with the gaming side of things. Recording gameplay footage is easy using software like Nvidia Shadowplay, and it was easier to set things up so that the videos went straight onto my cloud. Then once I'd played for a while, I was able to go load those videos onto the TV and check out some Overwatch on the big screen. Absolutely stunning. But using the MyCloud device only as an external hard drive is missing half the point of the device. WD has created a bunch of apps that can change the way you interact with the hardware. There are simple ways to organise your backups, automatically finding and saving certain types of files for instance, or nabbing your camera roll, and ways to set up your NAS device like a Google Drive or Dropbox account that can be used to keep your files synced across multiple computers. There are even smartphone apps so you can see what's on your drive while you are on the go. This sort of device really is what you make it. It can be something as simple as an additional chunk of storage space, an automatic backup solution, or the backbone of your complete home media library. The best thing, the WD MyCloud Ultra EX2 can be all of these things at once, and it looks pretty stylish sitting on your desk too. And that's about it for this edition of Player Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week, Johnny's chatting to Stainless Games about Carmageddon Max Damage, while I spend a bit of time with a VR mobile game, Castle Storm. Plus, Mike is dipping back into his video game shoebox for another retro treat. In the meantime, you can catch us at playerattack.com. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Also, if you want to support Player Attack, you can find us on Patreon and help us bring you the latest in gaming news, plus all these wonderful interviews and reviews from the world of video games. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.